Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me in the Betters Box, bangthebook.com's MLB betting podcast for Monday, July 22nd. I am your host, Adam Burke. This and every edition of the Betters Box presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the Sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. Monday, Thursday format here with the Betters Box, as you know. Coming up on Tuesday, we'll chat some college football with Rolf Michaels of wagertalk.com. So something for you to look forward to there. Not sure what we'll do on Wednesday as of yet. Better's Box comes your way on Thursday. And then Friday, we'll chat UFC with Christian Pina. Big pay-per-view event coming up on ESPN Plus here this weekend. Over at bangthebook.com, my MLB picks and tips piece has been updated. So make sure you check that out. All 32 NFL season win totals posted as well. Preseason games starting very, very soon here. So you want to start getting caught up on the NFL, what's happened, transactions, draft picks, all that type of stuff. We're going to start rolling out our college football stuff here this week. Uh, we've already been doing a little bit here, handicapping the Power 5 and Group of 5 college football head coaches. Uh, the college football power ratings for July 2019 have been posted. I'm going to get that spreadsheet up as well with all of my projected season win total numbers based on those power ratings. Uh, we've got a lot of good stuff going on at bangthebook.com, so make sure that you check it out. And also, if you missed last Wednesday's College Football Podcast with Brad Powers, a very good one there looking at the SEC, ACC, and Big Ten. So make sure you check that out over at the website. So you've got questions for the Monday Mailbag, and obviously we'll be doing that here today at Skating Tripods on Twitter or Adam at bangthebook.com via email. Also, you can subscribe to the show notes by emailing me, adam at bangthebook.com. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in here. We'll have our traditional Monday format with the Monday mailbag. Then we'll go beyond the box score, down the lines. I'll give you a pick for tonight's action and then what I'm looking at here for the week ahead. So let's dive in with the Monday mailbag. And we start with an email question from one of our longtime listeners. Mark, via email, says, I have a question regarding bet tracking. I'm at a bit of a loss as to how detailed I should go. Do you have different spreadsheets for the different types of bets you make for a particular sport? Also, do you have a separate bankroll or spreadsheet to track things like what I like to call jackpot bets, where I might lay $5 in a bid to win 500 or something like that? Now, as far as spreadsheet creation goes for tracking your bets, I do post that link to my spreadsheet uh, on Google Sheets every day in my MLB Picks and Tips piece. That's generally the format I use for all of the different sports that are out there. Uh, you've got rotation number, away at home, the type of bet. You know, obviously, if you're talking football or basketball, you know, spread, money line, teaser, uh, derivative, like a first or second half play, a live bet, something like that. The line that you got, the closing line value, the bet size, won or lost, percentage of money, won or lost, or units won for you know, those that like to do the units as opposed to the percentage side. But here are some of my tips when it comes to tracking your bets, putting together a spreadsheet. You want to make sure that you differentiate between the different bet types. If you're betting a spread, if you're betting a total, if you're live betting, if it's a derivative, a teaser, a parlay piece, something like that, you want to differentiate those different bet types because you want to see the areas where you may excel and where you don't. Maybe you aren't good at totals, or at least you think you're not good at totals, but then as you look down through your spreadsheet, maybe you're doing better on totals than you thought, or maybe you're getting a lot of closing line value on totals, you're just not getting the results. Maybe it's a side thing. Maybe, you know, your sides, you're not getting the best of the number, but you are winning. Well, maybe that's not sustainable. So you want to focus a little bit more on market entry, trying to figure out when you want to get into the market, try to get that closing line value. Are you doing well in the props market? If you're doing well in the props market, stick with the props market. You know, stick with the things that you're having success with. And if you separate that into each sport, Maybe also have an overall bankroll spreadsheet. Uh, you can track by hand if you want as well. But you know, the more data you can put in there, the more information that's in that tracking, the better off you're going to be because you're going to be able to eliminate areas where you're not doing as well. And you're going to be able to see what you need to work on. Is it getting more closing line value? You know, If you're doing really well on sides, maybe you should increase your bet amount on sides, maybe decrease on totals, kind of average it out a little bit, Something like that. You know, maybe if you want to even put the time that you made your bet, the day and time that you made your bet, 
to see if your market entry is correct, to see if you're out there getting the best of the lines. It's a hassle to set up, but once you get a good tracking system set up, then you're obviously going to help yourself down the line. You know, I mentioned this before, but for novice handicappers out there, one of the most important things that you can do to set yourself up for success is to be organized. It's to know, you know how you're tracking your bets, to know how your bankroll is set up, to know, you know if you're using a percentage system, correcting that every one or two weeks to see exactly how much you should be betting on your sides and totals and things of that sort. Being organized is very important because again, obviously you can evaluate your results quickly, but also if you're organized, you know, have Twitter lists of beat writers for each sport, Uh, have all of your magazines and your other reading materials in the same spot, have your bookmarks grouped into folders, be organized, save yourself some time, especially because if you're a novice handicapper uh, or somebody who maybe wants to get to a point where you can use this, As supplemental income, you've got a day job. You've got other stuff going on. You've got a family, a wife, a girlfriend, a husband, a boyfriend, kids. You know, you've got a lot of different things going on. And you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of effort by being organized. Take the time to set up that infrastructure. And that's very important to do here in advance of the NFL and the college football seasons so that you're prepared for those. You know, whatever resources you use stats, uh, you know, gambling content and information like our site or like the other sites that are out there, have those things readily available for you. Have them organized in a way that saves you time, that allows you to narrow your focus, you know, because there's a lot of shit going on, both in life and in sports. There's a lot going on. And if you don't have a narrow focus, you're all over the place, you know, and, and that's one of the things that's been Challenging for me here, I think, with this baseball season is that because it's not going well for me, you know, I've kind of tried to take a break from it by going more into college football, more into the NFL. I've started looking at college basketball already more than I usually do. I started looking at the NHL market more than I usually do. And it's hard because then your mind is going off in 25 different directions. And you can't be good at one thing if you're trying to be good at 25 different things. Unless you're some sort of, you know, freakishly talented intellectual mind, it's hard to do. So you want to, you know, parse out your time and you want to be organized. And those are two very important things here. I don't think you're going to hear a lot of shows talking about that. They're going to be giving out free picks and all this type of stuff. One of the things that I'm proud of with what I do at Bang the Book with both my content and the show here is that I try to help you get to a point where you can be successful on your own. Do I still want you to listen to us? Obviously, yes. But one of the most important things that you can do is be organized. Know what podcasts you want to listen to. You know, maybe you've got that 20 minutes to and from work every day. Know what you want to listen to. Know who you want to listen to. Know who you can trust. You know, you can probably cut down. And look, you know, it's one of the big things about modelers. And I wish I was smart enough to be one, but a lot of modelers, you know, they're moving substantial sums of money and their work handicapping the card is pretty small day in and day out because they've set up that infrastructure. They've put together that spreadsheet and that model where everything is already in there. It automatically updates or they just have to run a script, something like that, spits out their lines, they bet them, and then they follow the market throughout the day. You know, they check for updates. They know when the markets are going to move. And that's because they're organized. It's because they've taken a lot of time, a lot of man hours or woman hours to put together those spreadsheets, to put together those models of information. That's very important. You can't skimp on that, on that type of stuff. You have to set yourself up for success before you can actually have success. Maybe you hit some one-off future or some big parlay or something like that, but If you want to grind this out long-term, and that's really what this is for a lot of people, it is a grind. Set up that infrastructure. Set up that foundation. That's very, very important. Is it sexy? Is it fun? No. Does it fill that need for action? No. But it can put you in a more advantageous position as you develop, as you continue to grow as both a handicapper and a better. So it's very important 
to put together a tracking spreadsheet that can show you the areas where you excel, the areas where you don't, that can show you if you're getting closing line value, if you're getting out there in front of the market. You know, you're not going to get the best of the number, but don't get the worst of the number. You know, those types of things are very important to track. If you want to do it old school by hand, you certainly can. If you want to do it in a spreadsheet format, once again, over my picks and tips piece every day, kind of a guide for you to check out there. But again, you've got to do the groundwork. You've got to lay that foundation before you can start building the tower, before you can start building up that bankroll. It's very, very important. And it's something that I don't think a whole lot of people talk about because, you know, a lot of times if you're somebody who's been in this business for a long time, if you're kind of a seasoned handicapper or, or somebody in the media who follows this and, and writes about it or something like that, you take for granted that people may already know the basics. That people may already have all this stuff set up. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're new to the show or maybe you've been doing this casually and you want to take it up a notch. Get that foundation in order. It's very, very important. It is a time-consuming thing at the start, but it will save you time down the line. And that's very, very important, especially here with the, the football and basketball seasons coming very, very quickly. A very good time to start formulating your plan for the season, knowing what resources you want to use, organizing your data, and organizing those resources that you like to rely on. So, Good time for that question, Mark. Thank you so much for that. Hopefully I answered it uh, in a very long-winded way here. But again, as much data as you can put into your tracking as possible, the better off you're going to be. Again, save yourself that time down the line. You know, do it now. If you're not betting, obviously you're betting baseball because you listen to the show. But if you're somebody who does more football and basketball than baseball, now is the time you want to set everything up so that you're ready for that season. So very important to always be as ahead of the curve as you can possibly be. But again, set that foundation, put those cornerstones in place, and then go from there. All right, so let's go beyond the box tour here, talk about a lot of what happened over the weekend. And we'll start with this A's and Twins series. And what a fascinating thing this was. Oakland's bullpen blows game one. Twins bullpen gives up a tie game in game two. Twins blow the save in game three. A's blow the save in game four. So bullpens have been brutal this season. They're pretty impossible to handicap overall, but this series does wind up two and two as both teams pick up a couple of victories. You know, and when you look at this series here, realistically speaking, I feel like the A's probably deserved a better fate. In the first three games of this series, Oakland had 28 at bats with a runner in scoring position. The Twins had 11. And Oakland did win the first two games. Then in game four, which Oakland did have a chance to win in the ninth inning with that blown save, they had seven at-bats with a runner in scoring position. The Twins had 19. So that kind of leveled things off for the series. But realistically speaking, the A's probably should have won this series, uh, taking three out of four. But they were uh, unable to finish off game one. And then even still in games two and three, had to come back off the Twins' bullpen. I guess in game three anyway, not in game two. But again, crazy series, a lot of bullpen issues both ways. But something that was interesting to me here, in the four games in this series, Oakland starters only had 24 swings and misses. 24 swings and misses over four games for the starters. Not great. Mike Fires led with six, or with nine, excuse me. Uh, The twin starters in this series, 51 swings and misses. So, A lot more margin for error from the twin starters here. Uh, Kyle Gibson was great in game one. Odorizzi kept his team in the game in game two. Uh, Pineda had a lot of swings and misses in yesterday's game. But, you know, it's just very interesting to me to see that that there was such a disparity in swings and misses from the starting pitchers. And this is something that could hurt the A's down the line, especially with their bullpen not nearly as solid as it was last season. So Oakland's playing very well. I just worry about the sustainability of it because of that thin margin for error from their starting pitchers. The Cardinals took three out of four from the Reds and the Cardinals had lots of problems with the Red starters in this series, but their bullpen was the difference. They had some hiccups on Friday, but their bullpen, especially the middle relief guys really saving this series for the Cardinals taking three out of four. Uh, The Reds bullpen didn't do them any favors in this series at all, particularly the middle relief guys after the starters left the game. Uh, They had some really big issues there. 
you know, uh, right after Roark left the game, Robert Stevenson got knocked around. Uh, they had some they had some problems here in this series. But, you know, look, it was kind of an interesting series to sort of break down on a game-by-game basis. Because, again, you know, the Cardinals' bullpen really stabilized nicely, really got them to this series victory. But Carlos Martinez struggled once again, uh, gave up runs in three straight appearances before the save on Sunday. But then also the Cardinals, you know, Mike Schilt with the right call, quick hook on Jack Flaherty on Sunday after four and two thirds, uh, Gallegos comes in, shuts the door, bridges to the back end of the bullpen. But for Flaherty here, 17 swings and misses in 86 pitches, in particular 56 strikes. So again, a lot of times you look at the results, but for Flaherty here, only goes four and two thirds, but 17 swings and misses, a very good number there against that Reds offense. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt still struggling. Golden Sabrera on Thursday for him with four strikeouts. I do like the Cardinals tonight with Daniel Ponce de Leon against Trevor Williams, but they're still a team with a lot of problems. And offensively, they're not real exciting. The bullpen improving is very good for them, especially with their starting rotation woes. But, you know, a tough series there. You know, I expected something different than what we got. I kind of expected the Reds to fare a little bit better with their starters that had such big platoon advantages. Only game they win is the Luis Castillo start. Dee Sclafani was terrific on Sunday, but they couldn't pull that one out. Kind of been the story of the year for the Reds here, where, you know, the bullpen's good, the starters are good, the offense doesn't perform, starter gets rocked, they lose a slugfest, they blow a couple games late. They just can't get all facets of the game working at once. And this series was another example of that for Cincinnati. A strong effort for the Braves to come back and pick up a split against the Nationals after getting blown out 13-4 to in Game 1, uh, Kevin Gaussman very good on Sunday to pitch the team to a split. Kyle Wright was in a tough spot in Game 1. They pushed Julio Tehran back. Wright goes on short notice, was terrible in that game. But the bigger red flags to me for the Braves in this series, A.J. Minter struggled again, and then Tuki Toussaint getting sent down. Toussaint's a guy that kind of has a bullpen projection anyway, so for him to struggle so badly over his last 10 plate appearances – very, very concerning for the Braves. Uh, they've got to figure this bullpen thing out. I like Sean Newcomb back there. Luke Jackson has stabilized the closer role a little bit. But they got to get Minter right, and they got to get Toussaint right and get him back up there because he's got very, very good stuff, just not as sustainable over five or six innings as it is over one inning. So the Braves are kind of up against it a little bit from a bullpen standpoint here. Uh, seeing a lot of reports on Twitter that the cost for bullpen arms is very, very high out there at the trade deadline. Uh, they need to figure some things out here. So, you know, we'll see what happens with this Braves bullpen in the near term. But, again, something that did worry me a little bit about this series for them. Also some Batman progression for Mike Soroka here. But, look, again, they found a way to get a split. And that's important, you know, especially after getting blown out so badly in game one with that lopsided loss against Strasburg. Yeah, they avoided Scherzer, who's on the IL right now. But still, that shows me a team that's growing up, that, you know, they didn't get their best bullpen efforts in this series. You know, Luke Jackson had the blown save. They get the Donaldson walk-off. Minter wasn't very good. Toussaint sent down. The starters weren't particularly great. And they were still able to pull off a split here. And that's a really important thing. So this is a sign of the Braves growing up, like I mentioned. You know, they got blown out in game one. Could have given up some ground in the division, and they didn't. And you look for these kind of watershed moments for teams, in particular young teams and teams that are kind of, you know, new to being a contender. You look for these moments to really buy in and believe in what they're doing. That's kind of the case here for the Braves, uh, coming away with a split like they did here in this series. One other thing I want to mention about this series here, Kurt Suzuki, who of course was formerly with Atlanta, Seven stolen bases allowed by him in this series. Of course, not all his fault. It's also on the pitchers, too. But Kurt Suzuki this season, three caught stealings out of 30 attempts. Opposing runners are 27 for 30 stealing bases against Suzuki. So keep an eye out for that here as we go along throughout the season where some of these teams may kind of run wild. So the more aggressive teams on the base paths, could wind up having a lot of success against the Bra- or against the Nationals because they're going to go out there and run wild. So keep an eye out for that uh, with Suzuki, one of the worst in baseball at throwing out runners here so far this season. 
The Brewers took three out of four from the Diamondbacks, but the news is not all good. Brandon Woodruff with an oblique injury. Typically, you're looking at four to six weeks with an oblique, plus a couple of rehab appearances. So right now for Woodruff, he's probably out until September. And that's a huge deal for the Brewers. Woodruff with a 375 ERA and 117 two and two-thirds innings. The rest of the Brewers rotation, a 502 ERA in 387 innings of work. So this is a huge blow. When you talk about guys the Brewers can't afford to lose, Christian Yelich, Josh Hader, Brandon Woodruff. Big, big loss for them here. And the bullpen's been shaky. It's not been nearly as strong as it was last season. You kind of wonder where the Brewers are right now. I think they're kind of in limbo. You know, Madison Bumgarner probably not available now with what the Giants are doing. Uh, We'll see, obviously, what happens over the next nine days. But if they stay around in the hunt, they're going to give Bruce Bochy the chance to take this team to the playoffs. I think they owe him that much. Uh, So they probably won't move Bumgarner. Do they go after Trevor Bauer? Do they go after Marcus Stroman? Is Matt Boyd actually available? You know, is it worth going for it this year when the Dodgers just look so much better than everybody else in the National League? I don't know. You know, the Brewers have some tough decisions to make here, but the loss of Brandon Woodruff is substantial. And when you look at what happened to them here this weekend, Ulysses Chassin was terrible again. And also, their bullpen worked a lot. Freddie Peralta, back-to-back appearances for the first time in his career. Josh Hader with back-to-back appearances. That's rare. Jeremy Jeffress, who hasn't been very, who hasn't been nearly as dominant as he was last season. Uh, he's worked three out of four. You know, you got to watch out for them here in this series against the Reds with some pretty high bullpen usage. Zach Davies, seven innings, gave up one run on five hits, didn't strike out anybody. I don't know how this guy has not run into the regression monster yet. But the Brewers have a lot of worrisome things here, both in the short term and the long term. So I'd be very careful backing them here uh, over the next week, week and a half. Diamondbacks, their bullpen was poor once again. Uh, Diamondbacks' bullpen is just, there's been one guy, it seems like every game for them that's given up three runs. Their bullpen has just not been particularly strong. And also, you know, what are they going to do? Tonight, Robbie Ray goes against the Orioles, could be his last start as a member of the Diamondbacks. What are they going to do? You know, they've got some guys in the middle of the order that aren't producing or aren't staying healthy. Uh, They're very good at the top of the order, but they're very reliant on a few guys. Cattell Marte, Eduardo Escobar, um, you know, Gerard Dyson's been getting on base and making things happen. But, you know, Christian Walker's having a good season. David Peralta is solid. You know, they're they're really dependent on a handful of guys. None of those guys are really middle-of-the-order run-producing types of bats. Do they go get one? Do they try to make a run here? I don't know. I think the Diamondbacks are in a very weird spot over the next nine days as they could be a seller, but also you could justify being a buyer. So we'll see what happens with them here in the second half. Something I want to touch on here real quickly. You know, I mentioned last week that we've had a big increase in home runs, a very high increase in slugging percentage and home runs here in the second half. So one thing I did want to take a look at here. Team exit velocities from the first half to the second half, and obviously some very small sample sizes in the second half. So what I'm kind of looking for here, some positive or negative regression, and kind of trying to look to eliminate some noise because some teams have played much stronger schedules than others. So I've got the list of all 30 teams here from the first half to the second half in my notes, but I'm just going to highlight some of the more interesting ones here Two teams have seen a big increase in average exit velocity. The Cleveland Indians, up from 88.3 miles per hour in the first half to 90.2 miles per hour in the second half. I believe they're fourth in average exit velocity here in the second half. Now, Jose Ramirez is coming around, and he's hitting everything in sight right now. That's a big deal for the Indians. Oscar Mercado hitting, making a lot of hard contact, hitting the ball very well. Francisco Lindor. You know, obviously uh, getting a little bit of a breather during the all-star break. He's swinging it well. But also keep in mind, the Indians have played the Twins, Tigers, and Royals. The Tigers pitching staff is atrocious. The Royals pitching staff is not good. The Twins pitching staff is pretty good, but the Indians, you know, obviously have seen them a lot here uh, already over the last couple of seasons. So they got more familiarity with them. But the Indians going up almost two miles per hour in average exit velocity here in the second half. Is it sustainable? I don't think so to that degree. 
Will the Indians be better offensively? Yes, they will. You know, because keep in mind, this is a team that really got off to a bad start in the first half. Lots of low-velocity contact. And then as things progressed, they, they were still a fringe top-10 team in exit velocity in the first half. So they got substantially better in June, and they've gotten better here in July as well. So maybe this is just a team with some offensive gains, a team where hitters are kind of getting back to their normal levels. But also, they played a very bad schedule in June. They played a bad schedule here in the month of July also. So this may just be a byproduct of playing against lower quality pitching. And the Indian schedule is very challenging in the month of August. So I think this is kind of some fool's gold for the Indians. It's hard for me to say that about my favorite team. But I think that this is an offense that will regress as we go into the month of August. So maybe back to a lot of unders for them or maybe looking for spots to simply bet against them. But right now, I think that you know, as they keep facing bad pitching teams, they can keep this high-velocity contact attack going. But as they face better teams, we will see those numbers regress down towards what they were in the first half. Now, there could, of course, be bad at ball luck. You know, they may still continue to have good offensive numbers, but the chances of that will decrease as their average exit velocity decreases. So the Indians are a, an offensive regression candidate once we hit the month of August and they start facing some better pitching. The other team with a big boost in average exit velocity, the Washington Nationals, up from 87.1 to 88.5, so a 1.4 mile per hour average exit velocity increase for the Nationals. Uh, that's a big jump, obviously. You know, they've played the Braves and they've played some other teams here uh, in the you know, in the, uh, the first half or in the start of the second half here, that may be a little bit more sustainable, I think, because they're a good offensive team. They're a very good offensive ball club, lots of individual talent. I think what they've done here over the last six to eight weeks is more indicative of the talent that they have. So I think that this is more sustainable for them. I am a believer in the Nationals offense and that exit velocity increase that they've had here in the second half. Let's look at some teams that have dropped from an average exit velocity standpoint in the second half. The Atlanta Braves down almost one mile per hour from 89.2 to 88.3. I guess there's a little bit of noise. I think this is playing a little bit better of competition. I would expect them to stay a quality offensive team throughout the second half. So I'm not so much worried about this one. Some of these other ones I am. The Rangers down 1.4 miles per hour from 88.9 to 87.5. Their offense was overachieving in the first half anyway. I think that they're not a contender. I think they should trade Shinsu Chu if they can unload that contract. As Drupal Cabrera is a rental that somebody will be interested in as well. I think this is more of what we can expect from the Rangers here in the second half. So I do believe that their offense will continue to perform at a lower level than what they did early on in the season. The White Sox down from 88.7 to 87.3. The loss of Eloy Jimenez plays into this a little bit, but also I don't think they're a very good offense either. And this is a team that, you know, probably will see some increases as they play the Royals and the Tigers a little bit more. But I think when they face better quality competition, they will continue to struggle offensively. So I think this is one of the more sustainable drops out there. The Dodgers down from 88.3 to 87.3. That's a pretty interesting decrease here. Now, they did start with a couple of long road trips early on. They played the Marlins here this past weekend. Maybe there's some fatigue here for this team. While they are very deep, they did send some guys to the All-Star game and stuff like that. I think this is just noise. That's, that's really what I think this is here from the Dodgers. I would expect their offense to get back on track sooner rather than later, at least from an exit velocity standpoint. So they're not one that I'm worried about at all, uh, much like the Atlanta Braves. The, the St. Louis Cardinals. They were 28th in average exit velocity in the first half at 87.1 miles per hour. They are dead last in the second half at 84.7 miles per hour. Now, they're not that bad. At least I don't think so. But this is a really concerning number. Because you've got that power increase that I mentioned in the second half. You've got that big increase in home runs. And here's the Cardinals who are... 1.6 miles per hour worse than anybody else in the average exit velocity department in the month of July or in the second half here. 
Now, again, as I mentioned, I, think, I thought that the Reds were a tough matchup for them with their starting pitchers, but this is a substantial decrease. 2.4 miles per hour lower for average exit velocity for the Cardinals here in the second half compared to the first half. Now, I think it will get better, but, man, that's a glaring red flag for the Cardinals and their chances here in the second half. So keep an eye out for them where when they face pretty good pitching, they will probably continue to struggle. Something else I've noticed here about the second half early on, relievers are getting worse. In the first half, a 248 average against, 328 on base, 423 slugging. In the second half here so far, 255 average, 333 on base, 437 slugging percentage. So that home run spike that I talked about last week has carried over to the bullpens, but also starting pitchers, slugging percentage against up 20 points in the second half. So Again, we'll see how long this is sustainable, but so far in the second half, we've seen a massive power spike all around the league. Now, something else I've mentioned here, and I mentioned this with regards to the A's and the Twins, and I've talked about this as well, with the number of runs scored against uh, teams in the 7th and 8th inning here so far this year. How about this stat? Teams with a lead after five innings. Going to go back five years here. Teams with a lead after five innings. In 2015, 1,685 wins, 345 losses, and 830 win percentage in 2015 with a lead after five innings. In 2016, it fell to 811. In 2017, it was 828. 2018, 827. So really over the last four years, you're kind of looking at teams with a lead after five innings, winning about 83% of the time. In 2019, with all the bullpen issues that we've seen, an 845 winning percentage with a lead after five innings, 1,073 and 197. So even though bullpens have been worse this year than we've really seen them in any year over the last long while, win percentages are still up for the team with the lead after five innings. So that is fascinating to me. So a lot of us are bitching and complaining about bad beats, and it feels like I've been on a lot of them here with bullpens blowing games uh, in the late innings. But this is the highest win percentage in the last five years by a pretty large margin, given the sample sizes, of teams with a lead after five innings. So I thought that was really, really interesting to take a look at here today. What does this mean? Well, it could mean a variety of things. Uh, I, I think it means that... Teams that are trailing and are using non-primary relievers wind up trailing by more. I think that's part of it here. I think teams that aren't using their key guys because they're, you know, they have a deficit are giving up a lot of runs. So I think that's part of it here. I also think that part of it is a lot of inherited runners may be scoring. I have to double check this. The inherited runner percentage may be about the same as it is in the past, um, but that kind of, I, I kind of get that feeling where, you know, relievers just aren't doing as good of a job stranding runners for the starting pitchers. Uh, But again, I think ultimately, I think the big thing is just that, you know, teams with a lead are adding on and teams that are trailing are falling further behind. That's kind of what I'm thinking it is here with relievers giving up a lot of runs. But again, obviously, I mean, hey, we've, we've seen our fair share of blown saves too. You know, maybe those teams are just coming back on picking up the wins anyway. So been an interesting season to say the least for a variety of different reasons but that was something i kind of picked up on here today uh teams with a lead after five innings doing the best that they've done uh, at least over the last five years here let's take a look at the best defensive teams in major league baseball the dodgers 96 defensive runs saved just using defensive runs saved as the metric here diamondbacks 81 astros 66 the twins 50 rays and cardinals 48 indians giants reds and brewers round out the top 10. So again, as you're looking for those ERA to FIP and XFIP discrepancies, you know, some of these guys may just be benefiting from playing on really solid defensive teams. The Orioles minus 75, Mariners minus 64, Mets minus 56, Rangers minus 41, Nationals and Tigers minus 32, White Sox, Yankees, Pirates, and Rockies round out the bottom 10. A big gap though between the White Sox and the Yankees as far as the bottom 10 goes. Let's go down the lines here, take a look at some line moves dating back to Friday. Saw some heavy money on John Lester Friday against Eric Lauer in a fade of the Padres. 
Uh, interesting to see Lester taking money. Kind of talked about this before. When you see guys that get faded pretty frequently, then taking money, uh, the alarm bells kind of start going off in some of those situations. Uh, Lester, a guy that you know was faded a lot early on in the season, has kind of stabilized here and then took money there on Friday. So a very heavy Marcus Stroman money on Friday against the Detroit Tigers. Uh, Blue Jays won that one 12 to one, so the money definitely right in that game. Saw so Shane Bieber money drive the line up against the Royals from minus 250 to minus 290. Indians a winner in that one as well. Saw so some U.S. Chassin money on Friday for the Brewers against Taylor Clark and the Diamondbacks. Once again, and this move didn't work out, but when you see guys with really bad numbers taking some steam out there in the marketplace, it should catch your attention. Now again, Chassin was awful in this start, but more often than not, if you see a line move on a really bad starting pitcher, on it's not just you know a price grab, something like that, that's uh, something that you probably want to follow along with more often than not, but that one was a loser. Hunjin Ryu took heavy money against Zach Gallen on Friday. Gallen was very good in that start. Marlins lost that game 2-1. to one. Mike Leak actually took some money on Friday, almost through a perfect game against the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Also on Friday, Tyler Beattie money on the Giants to fade the Mets off of that 16-inning game. That was Jacob deGrom in that one. Uh, the Giants were able to prevail in extra innings there in that one. Once again, money coming in on a bad starting pitcher. Those are things that should kind of open your eyes a little bit. Saturday, we did see heavy Giants money again, this time in a favorite role. Jeff Samarja going up against Walker Lockett. Lockett actually pitched pretty well for the Mets. Uh, so the Giants were a loser in that one. Only game in that series that they lost. And, of course, we were on the Giants in that one. Big Rick Porcello money on the Red Sox against the Orioles and Thomas Eshelman. Uh, so that was an interesting one there. Saw some small nibbles on Jose Barrios and the Twins against the A's on Saturday. Uh, you know, Barrios at home, I'm surprised that he doesn't take money more often. Did wind up taking money there in that one. Saw some Griffin Canning money on Saturday against the Mariners. That was Matt Whistler opening for the Mariners. And then Wade LeBlanc being the bulk guy there in that one. Uh, Canning, a guy that you know I, I don't necessarily love, but to the Mariners, when you can fade them, uh, when you're laying a short price, a lot of people are going to look to do that here. And that was the case on Saturday. So some James Paxton money drive the Yankees into a bigger favorite against Herman Marquez and the Rockies. The Rockies did win that one, but also seeing Yankees money again today. Lots of Yankees steam out there almost with regularity. You know, when, when you talk about how bad a lot of bullpens around the league are, and when you look at the personnel in that Yankees bullpen, I think that's part of it. I think there's just a trust factor with the talent in that bullpen. And also too, maybe as the Yankees have gotten healthier, Odds makers haven't caught up to the price that a full strength Yankees lineup should be. So maybe that's the case as well. Saw some A's money come in on Sunday against Michael Pineda. That surprised me. Pineda pitching much better here of late, uh, but the market not coming in on him there in that one. Saw a big move on the Diamondbacks Brewers game. That was Alex Young. Once he was announced, that line came down about 25 cents. Brewers did win, but once again, lost Brandon Woodruff in the process. Sunday Night Baseball, people just hopping in here on the Braves. There's some late money to fade Joe Ross there. Kevin Gaussman off of the IL. Uh, always interesting to see moves coming in on guys that just came off the injured list. Looking at Monday here, we got Mike Clevenger's team hitting the board once again against Toronto. That's not a surprise at all. Eduardo Rodriguez, a big mover for the Red Sox against Jalen Beeks. Beeks making just his second career MLB start against his former team here, no less. Also, he's been a bulk guy in every game so far. Now gets the start. May only work, you know, into the third or fourth inning here in this one. And the Rays bullpen worked a lot over the weekend. So I like Boston. It's been a mover. Uh, we got it in the article at minus 120. It was in the minus 130 range when I started recording here. Do still like Boston a little bit, but obviously you're paying that premium with the line move on Eduardo Rodriguez. Seeing some CC Sabathia money against the Twins, that's kind of fascinating. CC, a guy nobody liked last year, pitching worse this year, but taking more money. And once again, like I just talked about, the Yankees taking a lot of money game in and game out. Big fate of Ivan Nova and the White Sox here against the Marlins and Trevor Richards. Uh, the White Sox, a fade team for the most part here at this point in time. The Mariners, a favorite for the first time since June 23rd. We'll see if this line holds, but if it does, the Mariners' favorite favorite, I should say, for the first time in a month. Uh, but again, we'll see if that line holds. So tonight, like Boston, as I mentioned, 
And I took the Cardinals tonight, too. I mean, if I get beat by Trevor Williams, it is what it is. Daniel Ponce de Leon getting the start for the Cardinals here. Uh, the Pirates don't walk much, so that helps with his walk rate. His home run problem slightly limited at PNC. The Cardinals do have a tired bullpen, but and Trevor Williams has been awful since he got back off the injured list. Had an adopted daughter. Uh, you know, A lot of things going on for him. He was sick over the weekend. A lot of stuff going on for him. If he beats me today, so be it. It is what it is. But I had to take the Cardinals here at the short price uh, as they're kind of rolling a little bit, having – you know, just won three out of four against the Reds and you're kind of playing a little bit better here uh, in the second half as a whole. All right, so what am I looking at here for the week ahead? Red Sox versus Rays is the starting point here. Ronald Rodriguez, Jalen Beeks tonight, as I mentioned. Chris Sale, Yanni Chirinos tomorrow. David Price, Charlie Morton on Wednesday. Big series for both teams here. You know, the Red Sox, two back in the Rays, three back in the wild card. Boston's taking some money today. I would expect them to take money tomorrow with Chris Sale on the mound, a fate of Yanni Chirinos as well. Not sure about Wednesday afternoon with Price and Morton, but Red Sox taking money tonight. We'll take money again tomorrow. So you will see how the Rays are able to fare there with that very tired bullpen. Reds and the Brewers. Sonny Gray, Chase Anderson tonight. Tanner Roark, Zach Davies tomorrow. Tyler Mayo, Ulysses Chassin on Wednesday. Look, the Brewers are up against it a little bit in the pitching department. The bullpen's been iffy. Now Woodruff's out. The Reds, solid pen, solid starting staff, but will they hit? You know, we'll probably see some Zach Davies money, or we'll probably see a Zach Davies fade on Tuesday a little bit. Probably see money come in against Chastain on Wednesday. I guess we'll just wait and see. But the Brewers, not a team I have a lot of confidence in right now. But, of course, as I mentioned with the Reds, a team that, you know, game in and game out, there's something else that doesn't work out for them. And it really has hurt them quite a bit so far this season. A's and the Astros, Homer Bailey, Garrett Cole tonight, Mike Fires, Wade Miley tomorrow, Chris Bassett, Justin Verlander on Wednesday. The A's are hot. The Astros are getting hotter. Big starting pitching advantages for the Astros in this series, as I talked about earlier on in the show. Not much to love about that Oakland rotation. Certainly not much to love about it here in this series either. They're a $2 favorite today. Could be a $2 favorite on Wednesday for Houston as well. But the A's playing very, very well. Uh, We'll see if their offense is able to hold up in this series. Yankees and the Twins. CC Sabathia, Martin Perez on Monday. Domingo Herman, Kyle Gibson Tuesday. Jay Happ, Jake Odorizzi on Wednesday. Yankees play the Red Sox on Thursday for a four-game weekend set. Will we see a Wednesday punt here from the Yankees? I think that's a possibility in that Happ versus Odorizzi game. They've seen Odorizzi a lot throughout his career. So, Maybe that is the way that things kind of shake out here. Again, looking ahead a little bit to that series against Boston, that big-time rivalry. I do like the under on Tuesday night, Domingo Herman, Kyle Gibson. Under is very scary to play, especially with these two teams. But I do like that under a little bit. Maybe the first five under uh, would be a better approach there. Cubs in the Giants. Alec Mills, Sean Anderson tonight. You Darvish, Madison Bumgarner on Tuesday. John Lester, Tyler Beatty on Wednesday. Will the Giants stay hot? Will they strengthen their buying position or just their not selling position? I guess we'll kind of wait and see, but this is tough. Anderson's a fade guy, money coming in on Mills today. Beattie's a guy with a high ERA, although he's been pitching very well of late. I'll be intrigued to see the line moves for this series. I don't know if I'll be too invested, but the line moves will tell me a lot about what people think about the Giants as well as what they think about the Cubs. One other quick note here, Padres and the Mets. The Padres getting Noah Syndergaard and Jacob deGrom this week. Could be some first five under angles in those two games there for San Diego. Wednesday marks a week until the trade deadline. You know, very quiet out there right now, but these next eight days, very important before the trade deadline on July 31st next Wednesday. Sellers are trying to emerge. Buyers are trying to find out what the prices of everything is. Uh, It's a tough marketplace right now. So we'll see what happens as we get closer to the trade deadline. But a lot of rumors, going to be a lot of smoke. Maybe a little bit of fire here over the next nine days. So you want to keep all that stuff in mind. Once again, Tuesday, I'll chat with Rolf Michaels on some college football stuff. We'll see if we've got something for Wednesday, Thursday, Betters Box, Friday, UFC. Another busy week here at bangthebook.com. I'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And remember that you'll never strike out when you're in the Betters Box.